The group moderator will be uh, Gregory Ahn, who is the founder and CEO of the Folktail Group, which manages the Folktale brand, and it, um, it was founded in 2009 and has grown to encompass 11 national wine brands, two wineries, over 400 acres of vines, four restaurants, and a national and sales distribution company. I could go on and on, but uh, Folktail is, is really uh, one of the uh, leaders of the pack in the uh, Monterey County wine universe, and we're delighted to uh, uh, welcome Gregory on, who will moderate a, uh, a panel of stars, and uh, including a couple of sisters. So, uh, so we'll start uh, at the far end with uh, Lori Coster, who is uh, the former chairperson and CEO of Man Packing Company. Uh, a, gr a grower, so here's all the fancy stuff. A grower, shipper, processor of fresh vegetables headquartered in Salinas's Central Valley, but, and, and she has a produce pedigree a mile long, but the thing I always remember most about Lori, and I think this relative to the subject of product development, uh, she had received an award a, a few years back, and one of the things she said, and I never forgot it, she, she said, however she got it, she had great, she felt like she had great gut instincts about products. And I, and I think the success of uh, man, man packing uh, is, is testimony to that. But I think she will also tell you she had, she had a pretty fair partner and her sister. And so I'll, I'll, skip o I'll skip over Christine. And closest to Gregory is Gina Nucci, who uh, also got started with, uh, with man packing in the new product as a new product development manager. And, uh, she uh, also brought to Mark, just to show off her creative touches, she was uh, involved with broccoli and uh, also <laughs> spent, uh, which, which I always thought was a great idea. I'm not an avocado guy. It, we have broccoli at our house. And uh, she uh, was also involved with uh, their website, um, and, uh, w which was one of the first in in interactive sites in the industry. Man was one of the early companies in the valley that made the shift from we're in produce to we're in the culinary world and the food the food world and uh, Gina was really instrumental in that so uh, it's uh, a pleasure to uh, see you here and then last uh, Christine Keller has spent the last 20 years in the CPG product development world working on blue sky and new to world food innovations have and she's launched products for Fresh Express, Man Packing, Dole, and Plenty. And uh, she has an impressive uh, background. She's uh, an acknowledged uh, uh, leader and has been interviewed and published in Vogue, San Francisco Chronicle, Chef's News, Progressive Grocer, Washington Post. Uh, and, and I like this one most recently. And I, I imagine there'll be some Googling while, while she's talking, but don't do that, wait. She can be seen in the documentary, Super Size Me Too, Holy Chicken. So uh, you'll, you'll, want to, you'll want to check that out. So Gregory, you've got a, you've got a great cast. Oh, yeah. They're all yours. All right, thank you. Um, OK, so uh, I've never moderated a panel before, so this is going to be really ugly. But uh, bear with me. Um, uh, don't forget the cards, right? OK, so uh, I've been asked to remind you guys that we're going to be passing out some index cards for you guys to write down questions uh, that we can ask the, the panel uh, towards the end of the presentation. I'm going to tell you, I could not afford to sit with these three women uh, to consult on my business. So this is a really uh, amazing opportunity for you guys to ask some questions of kind of some uh, industry experts and the experience that they have is unreal. So um, this is the coolest panel because we get to talk <laughs> about the sexy side of ag and the sexy side of food the because uh, one of the things that uh, I love is product development and innovation because you basically get to take something that doesn't exist, um, imagine it uh, as something that the world needs, put it out there, and my kids used to go crazy because I used to stand inside of stores recommending my wine or stand inside of restaurants buying people glasses um, and we would be there for four hours um, we'd have lunch and dinner at the restaurant because I was so passionate about new products that I developed and seeing them on a wine list or on a shelf. So um, uh, you guys are so lucky to be here uh, with these three power, 
power players. Um, so I want to, uh, so don't forget the questions. Okay, so we're gonna dive into some questions. Um, and I tried to approach this as a kind of a student's perspective because more than talking to other people in the industry, uh, we've got uh, the kind of future leaders of ag in front of us. So um, Gene, I wanted to start with you and just ask you kind of how you got into this business, um, what prepared you for success? Well, I was born and raised in Salinas, so obviously that kind of makes you grow up surrounding agriculture and being from an agricultural family. But also as someone who grew up in Salinas, I was like dead set on not returning to Salinas. Um, I had bigger and better goals in, in mind and stuff. And after college, or at college, I studied nutrition. So I always struggled with my weight, nutritional science and dietetics was my degree. And started working clinically, and that's when I kind of found out the whole, like, obviously food connection is where I wanted to be, not the science side of things, like feeding tubes and things like that, like working clinically. So ideally, it was like, wow, agriculture and growing these healthy foods and getting people to eat more of them was going to fulfill that goal, and I added marketing on to my degree. Um, so not ag marketing or anything, it was just generic business marketing, um, and that's why, where I went. Uh, and uh, Christine, how about you? How, what brought you into food, of all things, and um, uh, why product development? What, what's cool about it? Uh, there are so many cool things about it. I, I don't know where to begin with that, but um, what brought me to food was I was in Chicago. I had a journalism undergraduate degree. Um, doing PR for a publisher, which was something that was okay, but I wasn't really passionate about. I got hired by a chocolate company in Chicago to do PR for them. And someone quit in the marketing and product development department. And when you're young, I, I'll tell all of you, keep your eyes peeled for when there's an opportunity to step in and step in big. Uh, they said, hey, we need a hot body in this spot, and you, you have a brain, you can figure it out, we'll help you. I love chocolate. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to do that development? Anyway, so I stepped into that role, and then the light bulbs just went off. And I said, this is what I want to do for my entire life. This was so creative. It was so business-minded. It hit all the buttons. I got to listen to people. I got to eat everything. It was just so fun for me. Uh, when I was done with chocolate, uh, what brought me out to California was um, I was kind of looking around for something new to do. And I was interviewing with Armor Swift in Chicago and also with Fresh Express, which was brand new at that time. It was um, just packaged salad. Like at that time, no one really wanted it and it was kind of inconceivable. And since I'm a vegetarian, Armor Swift wasn't necessarily the right move for me. <laughs> um, but also I knew, I knew that this was an industry that had no rules at the time. And I still believe it has no rules. It's there, the innovation is everywhere. So, I came out to California, and it just continued to go from there, continued to go from there. Uh, Lori, if I were to want to get into innovation and product development and come work for you, what, what are you looking for uh, in a candidate? What kind of traits? I think, one test, test, just curiosity, you know, and it's so fun to cry, create products that you're the target audience for. You know, I've been that mom at 4.30 with two kids and I don't know what's for dinner. Um, you gotta love food, you know, at the end of the day. You know, my kids at the same, we're on vacation, I'm like, oh, there's a Deerberg's, I gotta do a store check. And my kids roll their eyes and here goes mom again into the grocery store. But I just find it fascinating, the, the merchandising and the lighting and why did they put that there and this over here and, you know, going to restaurants and analyzing menus and trends and not being afraid to fail Product development is very hard. What is it? One 80, out of eighty percent of products fail. Eighty percent of new products fail. And we've all had our fair share. Many. But man, <laughs> when you hit that home run, it's it, there's no better feeling. And again, to Gina's point, the fact that it's food that's good for you. You know, this is a very if you're looking for a, a wellness industry to work in, you know, we're not selling saturated fat. And granted, they might dip the broccoli in mayonnaise after they cook it, but what we're selling them, it's really, you're really helping families be better. Okay, can you guys talk about some of your big successes? Because you guys have done amazing things in this business. I'd love to, uh, including creating things that didn't exist before. <laughs> and uh, Could you guys talk about some of the big successes? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I, I actually like to talk about the failures, as Laura said, because there I'm are gonna, many. I'm going to ask you about that, too. <laughs> and, and we'll do that, too. Um, and I think I've created so many products, and the first one I put out was um, really scary. I watch people buy it, and I watch people walk away from it. But when I came to California, is when Packard Stout, as Laura said, um, it, we were trying to, the, the problem that we were trying to solve there was how do we convince people to pay $3.50 for a bag of lettuce that uh, they can buy the whole head, and they're very used to and they're very happy. They don't even know they have that problem. How do we convince them to pay $3.00? four dollars for a bag of salad at that time and that was the focus of those products uh, with fresh express I, I have to say there were some great leaders there who said try anything try anything so we started just pulling things out of the field talking with the scientists figuring out what could go together what couldn't go together how do we put croutons in there how do we package it how do we talk about it how do we market it who wants it and it just kept going and going from there. So, I mean, there, there were a ton of products there. Um, I, lo working, I also worked with Lori and Gina, for those of you that don't, don't know, and I saw both of them put out, uh, all together put out so many products. I, one of my favorites, the Better Burger Leaf that, that Gina did, and, I, and I'd love to hear you talk about that too, because I think that was one of the lovelier ones. And yeah. So I guess I'll talk about Better Burger Leaf, <laughs> just kidding. So Colby's in the um, audience, or she was, or she'll be speaking later. But a lot of our product development came from the field. And a lot of it came from ideas of better yields in growing, um, easier harvesting, um, products that won't break down as fast, so stronger cell structure. And a lot of that comes through cross-pollination and hybrid. So a lot of it comes in to like rows of crops where you're walking through the field and going, that one looks cool, or that one looks cool. And we had a product called our Simply Singles, and it's romaine and green leaf. That's basically the butts cut off, and they're all washed, and then they're packaged straight up into a small, nice little 10-pound pack. So companies and restaurants that do just burgers or just sandwiches or huge production for like airlines um, or you know Starbucks, can just take those lettuces and make their sandwiches and, and be on their way. And one customer, um, a restaurant named Arby's, was looking for a small hand size. They wanted it a burger bun size. And I still have the picture of the head of lettuce that we cut, and we found that the, there was, first of all, like 20 leaves on one head that were usable in the same size, which is really you know rare. But it was all that palm size leaves. We were measuring burger buns to try to find the lettuce. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a sourdough or like a Subway hoagie. You know, it was like, it was basically, they wanted this size. And so we, we found it and we worked with the seed company to then develop the seed and grow it. And that can take seasons. But nowadays with, you know, northern and southern hemispheres, you can actually grow seed a lot faster. Um, but a lot of that came from the need from a customer asking us for it and then finding it and creating it and then marketing it, which you know, a lot of other people had smaller greens, um, they called them teen greens, or there's other ones, but we always like to uh, trademark our names. I'm Gina Broccolini from Broccolini. Um, but we always, you always wanna trademark them so then you can then market them and people can't knock them off as fast. You want seed exclusivity, you want a brand name, and Man's Better Burger Leaf was our trademark and it's still a hit today. I know when we're at a restaurant or at Carmel Valley Ranch or anywhere, and I'm like, that's better burger leaf. Like, I know the leaf so well that people are like, oh my God. But it's really exciting when you do get something and it's successful and it takes like that. Well, often necessity is the mother of invention, and I think this ties into the conversation this morning. Um, man really focused on fresh cut vegetables, so we would cut broccoli florets and put them in a bag and sell them to chefs and, and retailers. Well, that left the broccoli stock being fed to livestock cattle. And for a lot of people, including myself, that's my favorite part of the broccoli plant. So it wasn't going to waste, per se. I love cows as much as the next person, but we created broccoli coleslaw. We shredded the stock, added some cabbage and carrots, and so we were able to sell it at a higher margin for the company. It's so successful to this day, sometimes we have to call growers and say, no, we just want the stock. 
We don't want the broccoli flora. <laughs> so the byproduct has literally become the product. But I think that's a great example of turning food waste, so to speak, into a profitable item. OK, so Gina Broccolini. I want to ask you about broccoli, because I think it's such a fascinating story that it was a product that existed in another, under another name, or? or yeah. and so then broccoli, does anyone know what broccolini is? <laughs> Back there. So it's a, it's a cross between broccoli and gai lan, our Chinese broccoli. And what it was was our seed company, Cicada, we buy a lot of broccoli seed because we grew a lot of broccoli. And they had this broccoli plant that they were developing to grow in Asia. And it was a warmer growing broccoli, is gai lan. And so they created this hybrid. And there was no, you know, no GMO involved. It was a mommy and a daddy, you know, broccoli plants together. And so we were, and this is before I even started at MAN, but we were doing trials for them. And unfortunately, it didn't grow in warm climates. It stayed growing here in the cooler coastal climates in the Central Valley, our Central Coast. And they thought that, well, it's not going to work or not. But then we tasted it, and it was so delicious and tender and the stock. And then when you kind of played with the growing of it and how to develop it, you could create longer stocks for that. You would pinch the head and encourage longer growth, and you would get multiple cuts. And then our, you know, we took that to then to chefs. We went to the Culinary Institute of America and worked with chef instructors there to ask them, how would you, because it was a brand new vegetable, and it was a weird looking broccoli. It was looser beaded head, had this long slender, it was a sexier broccoli, I like to say. Um, but they called it a sweet, a baby broccoli, a sweet baby broccoli. And our sister-in-law came up with broccolini as the name. So we kept it in the family there. But that started at chefs, and we just tried to bombard it with chefs. So if people were eating out, it was a higher, more expensive product because it was all hand cut. Um, so buying it at a restaurant, we always said the broccoli florets might be everyday dinner, and broccolini might be a dinner party you're hosting. Um, but that's how we kind of got that going, and it's still going today. It's still very susceptible to growing climates. It, if it gets cold, it stops growing. So that's another tough part about launching a product and marketing, especially to North America, is suddenly you don't have broccolini. Um, and then, you know, you, you're trying to get it covered. So that's been, um, it was very successful. It still is. And it's been, you know, it's delicious. You'll see it more often. Is, is the name Broccolini something that man came up with and trademarked? And yeah, so we trademarked it, and we almost tra got like all of our marketing efforts and PR efforts. Um, I came on the company, it was in 1998, and that's when we were doing a huge PR push for it. And it was on in Harper's Bazaar. Like, we got it in a fashion magazine as the fashionable vegetable. It was in the Washington Post. But we used it incorrectly, like a Kleenex, right? It's a tissue, but you guys call it Kleenex. It's almost became generic because of that. And so we had to do broccolini brand, baby broccoli. Um, and we had another competitor. It was the same thing. They called it Aspiration. And that's just when you need to go. Like, Doesn't that sound appetizing? <laughs> and it because it looked like asparagus, it was longer. And so that's where we were like, there's no way we're going to use that name. And they, you, know, you kind of work backward like that. So yeah. Oh, wow, aspiration. I, I, that sounds good <laughs> with, with, a, with a butter sauce. Um, uh, Christine, you look at trends to think about kind of how new products can be developed, new concepts, things like that. Um, I'm, I'm always curious about like the kind of the hot vegetable of the, the year. Um, broccolini, when it took off, it seemed like broccolini was everywhere, kind of still is everywhere. Um, nowadays, cauliflower I f find on every menu. Um, beets were uh, for a time, I don't know, pomegranate, uh, everything kind of seems to have its time. Can you talk about what kind of things make, make a product kind of everywhere? Yeah, that, that's a really fun question to talk about. So I worked for a company called Center for Culinary Development and Innovation, and I did trends there. So the whole idea of understanding trends and vegetables and anywhere else is to really just keep your eyes open. Um, start thinking about what you're eating, what you're seeing in restaurants. Many, many chefs are developing trends. And the way that we like to think about trends there when we're trying to identify them in vegetables or any other product 
was to sort of look at the fringe edges and ends of it. So understanding like what the high end chefs are doing, what the, what are the obscure things that are out there that some people are really really passionate about, and then watching them grow and spread into other products. So when you start seeing, we had a, a, a stage system there. So something in stage one was very niche and not very many people knew about it. If I said kohlrabi to you, you would be like, what is that? Um, Still, what is that? I, I picked that one up for a reason. Um, so you start to recognize the things that are on the fringes, and then you start to watch them grow. You see who's pushing those trends forward until it gets to what we call like a stage four or five trend is when you see someone like McDonald's pick it up or you see it in the grocery store. Um, that's when the trends start to move. And the influences of those trends are really uh, the people who are kind of, I, I like to say, waving the flag. And, and when you're innovating and when you're looking for ideas, you start to look in those fringes and those edge places and you start to see how things grow. I mean, acai is a, a product that was sort of small and done in Brazil. Um, and then all of a sudden now everyone knows what that is. It's in bowls, it's in drinks, it's in, in ev everything else. But it wasn't until one company really dedicated to pu pushing that as a consumer idea. And they found it from these rare, really rare places. So. That's kind of how it works. It's a lot about connecting dots and looking around. When, when you're developing products like, like that, how, how important is that supply chain in terms of like, how much can we supply? How, how fast can we grow it? How, how does it logistically travel from one point to another? Is that go through the product innovation kind of uh, yeah. process? Yeah, it's it's critical. critical. I think um, I worked on the food service side of things because of my food service management. Um, part of my degree and the need, but restaurants and, and, and food service distributors, I just saw the big Cisco truck pulling up to your student union here and unloading. So that's a food service distributor. That's more like door-to-door -door sales. It'd be like going, hey, Greg, do you guys want to buy, you know, Folktail, do you want to buy this product? And that's a much slower process. So you need to that's kind of usually where we go first, where we may give a customer an exclusive and kind of front load it and like guarantee some product and have them really push it and really market with them. Once the retailer group gets involved, then it's like, like if Walmart decides to buy it, you're like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? Because there's so many DCs, they're so big, they have to fill the shelves, they have to get, so you have to be ready and ramped up and have the supply to then, and that's you know growing. Luckily for us, our crops are more 90 day crops, like 60 to 90, so you can um, work in a shorter time. 60 versus to 90 days to grow the product? To grow yourself. the product, yeah, but then, you know, and some take longer, but versus like a pineapple or an apple or something, that's like a different type of crop. So we're more of a short-term crop here, so that makes it a little bit easier. And, and I'd say for that very reason, produce is the hardest place to innovate and develop and launch new products because of that. Um, it's not like you can just buy the flavoring and you can't buy the you know carbonated water and the equipment and turn it on and the supply is endless here. Um, as things shift and grow and let's say they catch on in a way that's fire, then, then it has to be supported by logistics. Yes, and with retail, you have to have a minimum of 16 days shelf life for the fresh vegetable products that we produce. It needs to make it to Boston, to the distribution center, out to the store, into the consumer's home. So if you don't have 16 days, a retailer is not even gonna to talk to you about a new product. They have margin requirements too. So you need to go in, the next time you go to the grocery store, go to the produce department. You know, there's a reason why there's so many facings of a certain product. There's a reason why that product is on this shelf and not this shelf. We have to go in with data and do what's called a space to sales analysis. Because the first thing a retailer is gonna tell you is I don't have any room. I don't have any room for new products. My shelves are full. So you need to go in and tell them which product to kick out to put your product in. And if you don't have that data, they're not gonna take the risk. The retailers make it a lot harder. Yeah, yeah um, in every industry, there's I think, retailer, <laughs> retail cons consolidation. Yeah, oh man. Take, takes me three years to develop a product. Um, okay, we're gonna, uh, I love to talk about failure because we learn so much from the kind of not as successful attempts at uh, new product development. Can you guys talk about some, some lessons learned maybe um, and products that, that maybe didn't live up to expectations? Kalets was my big one. I was so excited about Kalets. And it's, you know, kale, yeah, kale, whatever. And it's like a Brussels sprout Kalet. And 
it grew, it was so hard to grow, and when we finally got, learned how to grow, and we got it all bagged and ready to go, no one would buy it. And we were like, why? We, there was no reason. Like, they were popular, they were delicious when you fried them, and you'd season them, and it was just, it was difficult because there was a few people trying to grow it at the same time. The um, seed company went backwards. Instead of working with one grower, they went to many, and they kind of came up with the branding rules, so I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was more challenging. But that was one that we just were like, we thought it was such a good idea, and it just failed. And but we, we, pulled the, we, just pulled, but we the pulled the plug quickly. And the minute we pulled the plug, all the other growers trying went right behind us <laughs> and said, nope. Yeah, if we couldn't do it. And, and what, what do you think about it kind of made it not an opportune time for that product? Is it, was it because mu multiple people were trying to get No, I think, it was, I think it was very difficult to grow, and it was inconsistent to grow. Um, and the timing and spacing on it was, was difficult. I think, yeah, it was a real long crop, but I think the seed company probably should have had better research and development prior to taking it to market. But th I think the timing was so good because everyone was all over kale, you know, and they still, you know, kale, you still see that everywhere. Um, but so the t I think the timing kind of jumped ahead of the seed development, and I think they needed a little bit more um, advancement in that to grow it easier to then market it better, more abundant. I think you also need to look at the size of the prize. That's something we analyze. That was a niche product. At the end of the day, it wasn't going to be you know, broccoli or a packaged salad. So it really just wasn't worth the time or effort given the, the market size. Christine, uh, maybe you. Uh, oh, my list. What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> my list is long. My list is long, but because I'm sitting here with two people um, that we had a failure with all together, we may as well talk about that one. Um, and I think all of us still have a lot of love for this product. Um, I still make it. Yeah, so I, I think it was born from the idea of, you know, what are foods that everyone loves and what do people do with broccoli? And the idea and the marriage came together of broccoli, mac and cheese. And we were like, yes, this is a beautiful idea. We figured it out. We put a load of broccoli in with a nice cheese sauce and a pasta that you didn't need to heat up. It had a bag. It, I mean, it was, it was perfect and it was delicious. We all loved it and we launched it and it failed pretty quickly. <laughs> And I think it had to do with price, value, the retailers. I don't know if people were ready for it. They didn't understand the pasta. It, there, there were so many things that should have been right, but just a few things that made it go go wrong. And we did a lot of consumer research we did a yeah. ton with that. And people, it scored really high with the consumers we tested. So it wasn't like they weren't there. I just think it, it fell on the shelf and then the price maybe. Well, what happened is that there was good news, bad news. A very large retailer in Northern California said, oh, I love it. I want it. Great news. I want an exclusive for 90 days. Well, to the purchasing de department, that's great news because you can get a really good price on the cheese and the macaroni and we can plant the crops because we've got this huge customer. Well, what happened when we failed, we failed big. You know, it was in 400 stores. And retailers these days, their data, they know very quickly whether a product's going to make it or not, by week by week. So they didn't really give it a long time to get any traction. Um, we all did, we call it in-store intercepts, where you go in and you tell a consumer, hey, 10 bucks, let me ask you some questions. And they just didn't see it on the shelf. So again, be that weird person and go into a grocery store and watch how people shop. They're on the phone, they've got a kid in the cart, they're, they don't like shopping to begin with, and they're on autopilot. So to get a new product noticed at the shelf is very, very challenging. We don't have the margins to do commercials and um, promotions. But I, I do think that that's changing um, with Instagram and the social media yeah. and the new ways that you can market today. Um, back when we started this and when a lot of the products fail, it was really hard to, because the margins aren't there, to spend money on the advertising, which is a shame because people need produce and produce doesn't have the margins to actually put a commercial on television. That's changing and that's a good thing. And we did do a lot of social with that. We did um, mini commercials and like how it's going to save your time and how fast it was. Like after school, kids can make it for them and it's healthy and super fun videos, but it failed. Maybe someday. <laughs> At the end, it failed. But now I make mac back. and cheese and I cut up broccoli and I throw it in the water in the last two minutes and I still, my kids eat it. Well, and Lori, I like what you said that uh, 
you killed it quickly. Like yeah. when I think in, in the world of product innovation, uh, a lot of times people get emotional and, or overly attached to something and cannot kill uh, something that they feel is, this has got to work, this is genius. Um, we call it skew rat, okay. skew rationalization. <laughs> And I, I also think you just said something that's really important. If you do decide to go into product innovation, try not to get emotionally attached to your idea. Listen to people. Listen to what people are telling you. I mean, I think that's one of the tricks of being a very, very good product innovator and marketer is to listen. Listen to what consumers are saying. Listen to what your colleagues are saying. Listen to the problems that are there. And don't just say, because it was my idea, it has to succeed. It's everyone's idea. Let ideas come in and let them go as easily. Uh, so uh, we, we brought up social media or digital marketing um, as kind of a, uh, a technology-driven change in, in the marketplace. And since, since we're talking about uh, tomorrow's marketplace, I wanted to kind of talk to you about uh, or ask you about what, what the crystal ball looks like. Like how has the marketplace changed in the last uh, five, ten years? And what do you see happening? Kind of how, what, what are the trends that you see ha changing the marketplace for the future? I'll start. Um, so I was in charge uh, in charge of corporate marketing, and that involved a lot of the product marketing for us. And the difficulty we had. So we, Nourish Bowls was one of our most successful recent launches. It was. It's delicious. It's there. You can find it at Safeway. It's in the Safeway brand, and then there's some um, in the Man brand still. But that was difficult because once we got a retailer on, what we tried to do is we tried to partner with the retailer, grocery store, social. Um, we also worked with a lot of bloggers who were big um, regionally. So we actually, it, w it, was, it was good and bad is that we had this national platform, but we, it, you could take social media and advertising to a, to, a, to a region and really focus on it. So that was really successful for us in getting the word out, getting them there, finding the influencers, as they're called now, um, bloggers and stuff. But really having them use it, how they use it, you know, Insta stories. It, I mean, so that was one, and we're still doing that today. Um, man's this, so that was really successful. We need, we need Kylie Jenner to have some <laughs> KLS. And yeah. You know? That would do it. <laughs> Possibly. Um, I'll talk about technology from a, a different perspective. Um, I most recently worked with a company called Plenty, which is growing indoor vertical agriculture. And the first time I walked into that farm and saw what they were doing, um, for those of you who don't know, um, they're growing produce with LED lights, no soil, indoors in warehouses um, about 20 feet tall. And the minute I saw that, I thought, wow, this is going to change agriculture in many ways. Um, as Lori was saying, you know, you have to have 60 days of uh, produce, um, 16, sorry, 16 days of shelf life on the produce to get it across the country. And when I started working in agriculture, that was such a big change is what we saw. is like you could move things across the country and get it there in you know, a few days and this was great logistics. Um, what, what they're looking at doing now and where some of the future will be is, and, and I think um, in countries that can't necessarily grow produce like we do here in the Valley, um, they can put these farms up and get the produce two places in you know the same day and deliver it right away right when it's harvest um, that's going to change things I think that you know consumers want produce they're thinking more about it and all of us know if you go to Chicago in the winter you know we turn up you know we're so used to produce all the time we turn up our nose like this is horrible this tastes horrible um, so I think that the consumer expectation will change because of that and I think that places that really really need fresh produce like China and the Middle East that can't grow it, or Japan for that matter, um, will start getting into that, that piece um, of freshness. So I think that there's a huge opportunity there if it's grown horizontally, if it's grown vertically, how it's grown and how quickly it can get to consumers, that's gonna change some stuff in the future. Is, do you think that the uh, idea of what is delicious is changing? Have consumer tastes evolved? I think so. Yeah. Um, Definitely. I think understanding that when you get a, a packaged salad, you know, the, the smell when you open it, like consumers probably never noticed that before, but like their palates are changing, you smell, and it's different. 
to this day, I think that, that you know, the, some of the technologies that we had to use in the past have improved. Um, and this is where all the scientists come in because it's that's the side that's super fun and I know nothing about. But you know the breathable packaging, so it's the oxygen transfer rates. For vegetables, you don't do a nitrogen flush like you would with salads. Um, and nitrogen basically puts the product to sleep. Well, so does keeping it cold, and so does keeping the CO2 in and the O2 out. So there's that kind of the science behind it is, is getting more advanced, and I think it's the timing is probably great for that too with um, the pallets changing and things going. And, and I think culturally um, the trend is changing too. We're, we're culturally more curious, people all over the country, people in Iowa um, are looking at all sorts of banis and just different things. People are curious and they can learn about foods in a lot of different ways. So um, one of the ways that I like to think about, you know, taste changing and people getting more used to it is you just watch what the fast food companies are doing. And, and they may be doing it um, just to, to seem healthy, but you know what? People are eating it and people are getting it and people are trying to understand these different flavors and different ideas of food. And that's driving consumer taste and fresh happens to be something that people are really starting to understand better. You always say fresh is best. Fresh is where it's at. But... In all honesty, that's where the retailers are investing. It's in their perishable departments. Um, the center aisle sales, they're losing them to the big box stores. So if you want to get into marketing and food marketing, again, there's the wellness factor, but there's also, those are the growing categories. You know, our fresh cut vegetable category is growing at double digits, in, and that's without advertising. Imagine if we had some promotion dollars. So um, it's on trend, and that's where the investments are being made. So you guys are all eating that uh, kombucha stuff, and it's changing everything. Yeah. Sriracha. <laughs> Sriracha, yeah. Um, how, how much is wellness uh, driving product innovation versus, say, convenience or um, you know, other factors that in the past? You don't want to say anything is healthy. I think you want to say it's whole. I mean, people know that vegetables are healthy, but once you kind of, it's, it's that heart right on it thing, but you need to make it taste good, mm -hmm. um, and you need to make it convenient, and I think that is the best, you know, kind of combination that you have. It needs to taste good, it needs to be fresh, um, and wholesome. Yeah, I would agree with that completely, and I think convenience, um, while it was the main driver back when fresh packaged salads started, um, I think convenience is the ante in. You always go in and thinking that no one has time unless they're a foodie or you're developing a very small kind of niche product. So to me, convenience has to be there for anything I think about and that has to do with packaging and, and pricing and where it's sold and all of those different things and taste. Those two things have to be there. Other than that, go for it, try anything. But I also think, too, you need to remember, too, that consumers changing. I think a lot more of our consumers care about where your food's coming from, want the story behind it. Um, I know a lot of people who are doing the home delivery, and it's wonderful, but then they're like, oh, my God, there's so much packaging with it. You know, so it's that you want to make it convenient where you can just go boop, 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 you know, and drop it in like you're a chef on the Food Network, and it's all prepped for you. Like, I could cook like that, too, but having to chop and, and measure and everything else, but those come in, and then you're like, you have all that packaging left um, is almost a hindrance for some. You know, some still love it, so it just depends. But there's the opportunity to innovate right there. Get rid of the packaging. How do we do that? Start thinking on that. Yeah, uh, looking at some of the uh, questions that came in, things like compostable packaging, the environmental impact of packaging, um, single single use uh, type stuff. Do you guys, do you guys, are you guys aware of innovation going on in there? And do you see a future in which, I don't know, plastics disappear or? Yeah, one example I use a lot of the the packaging efficiency is in the supply chain. You know, no one wants to ship air across the country. And we had a product once for Walmart. It was bunched broccoli, but it was shrink-wrapped. And the consumers are calling going, I don't need my broccoli shrink-wrapped. Why are you using all this packaging? Well, we were able to ship it iceless, which made the freight lighter. Um, we were able to ship it in a recyclable carton, not a wax corrugated carton that couldn't be recycled. So the consumer face was, look at all this packaging, but behind that was tremendous sustainability gains, but they didn't see that. Is, is that a benefit of the product that can be marketed? I mean, is that, 
are consumers looking for an environmental impact statement from their products now? Yeah, I mean, I think looking at the clamshells, I mean, we've never had clamshells, and now it's like everything is in a clamshell. That's merchandising efficiency, that's shipping efficiency versus the bag. It's also great, you can reuse it, but it is plastic. And then you've got to think about the shelf life because you can't control atmosphere in some of them. Um, a lot of the post-consumer um, items we're looking at more in food service because we it doesn't have to be clear film like you want to be able to see the product so having it cloudy having a tray cloudy is less expensive and less plastic than a clear perfectly clear one so you could do it more of a clouded bag on those versus others I mean, all I can say is I know I'll take it from the food industry in general. Everyone's looking for those solutions everywhere, and, and that's a great thing. With produce, it's particularly hard for the reasons that Gina mentioned and for the reasons that Lori mentioned behind everything. There's that all the things that are happening behind the scene that are making the industry more sustainable. It's a really, in produce, it's a really hard problem. Um, in other industries, it's a little bit easier, but you know, it's the science that's there. It's the moisture of the product, the things that break down. So um, I haven't seen it solved. I know there are a lot of really smart people working on it. Um, I, I did read an article that in Peru, they've figured out a bag um, that can be made of a compostable plastic. And, but it, it can't hold for that long. So, I mean, there's hope. I know people are working on it. I just haven't or, seen it. Yet. Or can't take the cold or the heat, they can't take any extremes. So that's why like the, you know, your cups or your, you know, packaging, like to-go food and things like that, you see that more because you'll see too, it barely makes it home when you're taking food to-go. I'm sure you guys use it in your bowls and rolls, Pacific bowls and rolls like stuff. So that's a little bit easier to do than for shipping. Right, performance, performance of the packaging isn't always uh, where it needs to be. Uh, but we're trying. <laughs> yeah. And that's where I think, too, you got to think about um, the value added because you're leaving the waste in the field. I know that um, when Christine, Christine yeah. spoke earlier about all the waste in the field, that's going back in. I mean, our number one job is to use that waste, like we said, with broccoli coleslaw, but understanding that having it all convenient, we're also saving on resources across the country with just 100% usable product at the, at the end. And the leaves in the field are disked back into the soil, providing nutrients. So we are using 100% of the plant. In fact, Walmart loves that sustainability story about you take a broccoli plant, well, we take the stock, we make broccoli coleslaw, florets, and then the leaves get disked back into the soil. Um, we, we got quite a few questions about kind of lifestyle in the ag business. And so um, I'm going to start with kind of a more general question that, that an audience member wrote is, uh, what do you enjoy most about working in the ag business? And would you recommend the ag business as uh, an industry where you can have a balanced life? I'll start with that. Um, I love it because it changes daily. Um, you know, with crops, um, it's always changing. You know, Mother Nature's your enemy and your, your, your best friend. So understanding that, it's always going to be different, always exciting. What I loved about it that I really didn't appreciate growing up here is how global it is. Um, you know, in marketing, I, our, our market was North America. I got to travel through the entire, you know, United States, all through Canada, um, Puerto Rico, Hawaii. I mean, it's really global. And then even other crops are even more global. A lot of our local processors here have production in Mexico. And we actually have production in Mexico. We don't sell and market to Mexico, so we didn't travel there as much. But it's really a global marketplace, um, and, it, and it's here. So understanding that there's sales desk jobs and there's jobs in the field that you can you know travel around on, um, but and then sales jobs that you're here locally staying, but then marketing and other sales, outside sales jobs that you get to travel um, all over and see different things. And then I would say, you know, Christine, listening to Christine Mosley talk about her passion for it, you guys saw, you know, she's working probably 100 hours a week. What I think, and I identify with that, so the lifestyle of, of the industry is really fun, but y you have to be passionate about it. Like Lori said, you have to love food. You think about it all the time. It's your lifestyle. So the balance of all of that is really fun if you, if you love what you're doing, and, and I do, and I know these ladies do too. 
um, the balance is there, and you find it. And it's about working hard, particularly when you're young. Um, that's where you pay your dues, and you work hard, and you love it. You, you have to love it. Otherwise, try something else. Run, run a parking lot. Um, ho hopefully not too many people in this room are dealing with this, but uh, there was a question about balancing, uh, balancing kind of work-life balance, especially as mothers or spouses or... Um, and how, um, how do you guys, what, what kind of uh, techniques or mindsets do you use to balance those two things, besides dragging your kids into stores to do uh, It takes a village. Um, yeah, so I was, I'm, a, I, I'm not working now, but I was a working mom. And, you know, the kids are in school. You would drop off, pick up. So one thing to be aware of is your hours. We had salespeople who have to come in at 6 or 7 you know, and having them drop their, they would drop their kids off at a daycare before school and then get there, but you also get off at three or four, so you have more of an evening. So whatever you choose, um, you know, it, it, it flows and it depends. Um, I know in production jobs, you have, there's usually two shifts. There's night shifts, there's day shifts for that, but um, yeah, it works. A lot of people are doing it. A lot of dual income. Um, travel is, to me, was one of the things that kind of happened was harder to deal with, being gone for days on end, where when I was single, I was, I'd be gone for two weeks straight. I loved it. I've traveled everywhere. I was a, called a road warrior. Um, but you get, old, that gets old kind of fast, so. I think I majored in public relations, and I had a minor in business marketing, so I thought early on I would be able to work remotely, you know, if my child got sick or, you know, traveling on the road, and that was before iPhones, so. Um, think about if you want to, you know, focus on a certain discipline within business or science. Do you want to be chained to that desk in the mainframe in the same office every day, or do you want the flexibility? Do you want to be able to travel? Mainframes are in the cloud now. And um, <laughs> can you tell we're sisters? <laughs> and in my case, when I went back to work full time, my husband um, was a primary caregiver, so he stayed at home with the kids. Mine was too. And I'll say, I, I don't have kids, um, but I'll tell you, working with so many women like these two ladies and all the other women that I've worked with in my career, the, the most efficient people in the office are women with children. They, know, they don't have time to stand at the water cooler. They get stuff done. They figure out how to do it because they do have those lines that they have to draw and they have to get to them. And so I often say, you know, women with kids can do things twice the speed um, as anyone else, because they, they have a goal to reach. And, and balance is what you, you want it to be. And so you have to draw your lines and do what you need to do to get, get your work done. That, that's going to go into my HR file now. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're going to recruit moms. Um, the truth. Uh, you know, there, there were some additional questions about the environment. It's the environment is the environmental impact of agriculture is is a big deal. Um, obviously, um, meat production has gotten a lot of focus over the last decade. But um, uh, and then we've got some questions about further about um, has packaging decreased over time? Has uh, is that are those trends being driven by? Well, I, I know what I think in terms of are those more sustainable practices being driven because consumers are demanding it or because companies are pushing it? Um, what do you guys think about uh, what's driving those environmental kind of adjustments? Margins. <laughs> I mean, there's no grower, shipper, processor in this valley that's shipping packaging that does not have to be there. Trust me. I mean, we measure it down to the diameter, but we need to get that oxygen transmission right. Sometimes the bag needs to be bigger sometimes smaller, but again, it's the supply chain. Sometimes because that product's in a bag, it doesn't need to be iced versus shipping it iceless. So again, it's frustrating sometimes. A lot of it's behind the scenes, and I know you, you can go on the website and, and tell your story, but I'd encourage the next panel are really the experts in that area, and they can tell you what they're doing in terms of sustainability. I also think that, um, I, I don't know, who believes what, but I see that there's an urgency to save the planet, and things are heating up. Um, you can see them, people are talking about them, and so that's driving a lot of the interest in, in making everything sustainable. I will say too, a lot of it is driven by regulation. 
you know, we have to have a shelf life, we have to have a UPC, you have to have this, your country of origin, you have to have the net weight statement. In Canada, you have to have it in English and French. You know, a lot of times the retailers won't take it unless it's in this type of package, so a lot of it's out of your control sometimes. Do you think customers are willing to, as it becomes such a important issue that customers are willing to pay more for um, products that tell a sustainability story? I mean, I think organics, people were paying, are maybe are still paying more for organic. Um, is is uh, packaging and, and sustainable farming, is that also having an impact that, you know, because it's more expensive, is it uh, something that people pay more for or willing to pay well, more for? Well, unfortunately, that decision is being made for them by Walmart or Safeway. You know, you need to say, okay, are those buyers going to put their money where their mouth is and pay the growers more for the sustainable packaging. And from my experience, that has not happened. Or if you do do cost savings, like we had our, our veggie trays, which was a great, we removed the plastic lid. We did research. No one, the whole idea of that plastic lid on your veggie tray was to flip it over and have a veggie tray. People who are doing that are cutting their own veggie trays, right? You're, um, so people were using that as a lid too, but then most of the people were just taking it off and throwing it away. And so we used a higher gauge film that you could use that held up and people still use it. They wanted to know how much that cost saved them <laughs> and then they wanted the savings there. So you could take away, but then, then it's there. So you have to be wanting to do it for your own, you know, and being- And we a, did it. And we did it. The family business, you know, you want to have that, that story. You want to be able to, you know, you're having your own family eat this food and your children growing up, you know, around this area that you, you're wanting to do the right thing too. But I think ultimately consumers will listen to the retail, the retailers will listen to consumers. It takes them longer. They, they want to put more money in their pockets, but eventually they'll get there. And yeah. when they consumers do, will go. Yeah. So, you know, keep talking about it. So I got the five minute, uh, marks here. So I just want to kind of maybe, uh, offer the students kind of the last tidbit of wisdom from these three, kind of the mantra, the, as they go out into the world and uh, um, change agriculture forever and change how I eat, what kind of advice would you give, give us as we uh, embark on that journey? I would say to try to intern and try different things every summer, you know, to try to work somewhere else or every, to work a night job, a part-time job, um, so you get a real hands-on feel for it. Um, I know we, at, at MAN, we had hired a lot of the CSUMB students that came and we interned for, um, and it's, it's, it's something that, that's real, because then you're gonna really get to know what you wanna do and what you don't wanna do hands-on. So it's great to get lots and lots of experience in a variety of different ways. I think that's great advice, and I would say add curiosity to that, which is what Gina's saying. Try lots of different things. Don't lock in on something that you're not 100% um, passionate about. Check things out, learn, listen, um, and move around and talk to people. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to fail. And I would say get out of your box. You know, we're very fortunate here. This is utopia. I mean, we have farmer's markets. We have Trader Joe's. We have Whole Foods. We have Costco. Well, a large part of North Americans don't have that and you're gonna be developing products for a mom with six kids in Detroit, and AMPM is her grocery store. So think outside of the box and outside of the world that you're living in because you're gonna be working in an industry that's providing products for a lot of different demographic and psychographic audiences. All right, well, I think we're out of time, so I wanna thank our three panelists, and thank you guys for your thank time, you. and enjoy the rest of the day.